a lame brained idea. Especially the kind of people they're letting in cannot be trusted. But here's what happened. In Mexico, the republic fell apart. And a man who was elected president, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana, or just simply Santa Ana, he, partially because he wanted to have full power, but also it was breaking apart. He made himself dictator. He kept all the trappings of the government, all the names of the republic, but made himself dictator. And Santa Ana was very intelligent, creative, he had a high opinion of himself. He called himself the Napoleon of the West. But, but, to try to get control back over California, but especially Tejas, no more immigration. They're going to cut it off. Now, they can't stop it. There's hardly any troops up there. Remember, part of the reason they want to stop, what was the tribe that just ravaged this area for? Settlers. And don't forget, the Comanches are trying to protect their land, but they're also attacking other tribes, too. There's not enough truth to stop them. But the other thing was this they officially banned slavery. No more slave codes, no more slaves, it's done. Now, the Mexican idea was much like post Native emancipation. They would free slaves and then ship them, they would, the slave owners would sell them back here or leave. That's what actually they're holding, just leave. This has failed miserably, having American immigrants come, and hopefully they will go back. Well, that, abolishing slavery to the Texans was like a declaration of war. As they see it, we have land but no labor. We, will, um, we borrowed money to come here, or the squatters just came there, and we will be in real trouble, and this would trigger a revolt. And with that revolt, Santa Ana formally ended local government. Slavery would trigger the revolt, or even more like uh, kind of just a, a low-key rebellion. But as soon as the Mexicans ended local government control, we have full-scale rebellion. Now, if, tax, if you go to Texas, they'll focus on they ended local government, so this was tyranny. Yeah, there was an element of tyranny, but they don't like to talk about the trigger. Slavery. We want the liberty to have slaves. And so this would begin the War of Texas Independence, 1835-1836. And the Battle of Gonzales, in a lot of ways, would kind of symbolize this. There's a local militia in Gonzales, Texas, and they had a camp. And local Mexican officials, and they had a few cavalry. That's all. There's hardly any Mexican troops. We're going to take that cannon. That cannon gives militia kind of a real sense of power. And they held it. They wouldn't let them take it. And this is the flag, would be the first flag of Texas to come out of this. The cannon would be, come and take it. You got to admit, this is kind of cool. I, I can't deny that. By the way, copy of the United States. The United States had stars for each state, so they just used a star for the Republic. So you see a, a few flags with just a star. Yes, that's coming to be Texas as the Lone Star Republic, and then the Lone Star State. Yes. Uh, Texas, let's do it right now. Okay. They would unify together, and Texans were the name given to the immigrants from the United States. Tejanos were Mexican citizens who already lived there when Mexico became a country. So they were, they were the original Mexican citizens there. So then they, they both wanted to keep the state they were. Um, they both would join the rebellion. Okay. And a lot of Tejanos, yes, they did have some slaves. But their big reason they rebelled is they were tired of rule from Mexico City. They saw Mexico City as being distant and foreign, and they didn't revolt from Spain to get another distant leader. But they both joined together. I wonder who's going to get uh, kind of iced out of Texan government when it became a republic. Does anybody want to guess? Oh, yeah, I think it's going to be the Tejanos. But! So they joined together, and Santa Ana would begin to organize a couple thousand men. Now, these are constricted. They're draftees. They're better equipped than the Texans, but not very well equipped. They had to march a thousand miles over the desert, and his plan was to knock the rebellion out. 
knock them out and force the Texans that still want rebellion to leave. In fact, give them a choice. Die or run away. That's your choice. There's no independence. So he was going to use a measure of terror. This is the way colonial powers have done all the time. The Texans would choose Sam Houston to lead that hodgepodge of militia, Texans with the Hodges. And his goal, save the army. Keep it together. Save it. A little like this should remind you of George Washington. Because he knew the Mexicans are going to have the advantage in numbers and equipment. And he fought in the War of 1812, and that's why they gave him command here. He was a protege of Andrew Jackson, he kind of copied and emulated him. We'd go to the U.S. Senate from Tennessee, but then his wife passed away, and it just crushed him. And he started drinking heavily and kind of lost responsibility and did what a lot of people did. He went to Texas for a fresh start. In fact, that's kind of Texas. They, they push this image to this day. You have trouble someplace? Go to Texas. Yeah. So, what was he? The Texan army. Okay. The Texan and Tejano army. Okay. Against the Mexicans. And the Texans and Tejanos are the rebellion? Yes, there are the rebellion. Now, Santa Ana would lead his forces north and he divided them up. And we're coming up to the first real battle. Actually, the siege in a very short battle. End of February to March 6th of 1836, the Battle of the Alamo. So Santa Ana went to the main force of the first really big city, San Antonio. His other force was going south. And the plan was basically to scoop up any Texans or any rebellious uh, soldiers as possible and push them out. The bulk of the Texans and Tejanos were here, better soil, a little wider. And so that's his plan. And when he got to San Antonio, there was a Spanish mission. Now, this mission had a church and then basically a walled uh, city inside with quarters, um, corrals, barns for, for animals, uh, like a blacksmith shop and things like that. But it has a wall around it because of the Comanche. And so it's like a fort. All that's left today of the, of the Alamo is just the church. So imagine a big wall community commanded by William Travis. And Travis was a, a failed lawyer who came to Texas. Hey, love you. Failed there. Let's go to Texas. And Texas, don't, to this day, you can come here and get away. Well, here's what the Alamo is a model of it. And it's massive. And they have less than 200 soldiers. Not very well trained in a few cannon. They dug a redoubt around the main gate, but had to defend this entire wall. And some of the walls are as high as 14 feet high. It's, they don't have near enough men to hold. Houston ordered Travis to leave. Save your men. We don't want them to be killed. But Travis foolishly stayed, partially because, if you remember way back when we talked about Bunker Hill, and said, you know, they thought one big battle would win the war. Travis had in his head that the Mexicans um, could be convinced that we fight hard enough. We hold them off the Alamo. We win this big battle, which is close. That's what he believed. And so he thought, we'll win the battle. He really was thinking Bunker Hill. It was a terrible place to defend. And when the Mexicans arrived and surrounded them, they couldn't leave. And they couldn't fortify the whole area. Santa Ana gave a few days for them to surrender, saying, if you don't surrender, there'll be no quarter. No quarter means no prisoners. And they stayed. They didn't surrender. And so on the 6th, actually the night of the 5th and the 6th, the Mexicans attacked. And they had so many more men. Such a huge advantage. Here's a painting of it. They did a couple diversions here and here with the main attack on this corner. Why? The walls are 14 feet high, and there's only about one tax in every 10 feet. So they can hardly hold out. I think about a 14 foot high wall. There's firing steps, so you can fire over the wall. But a wall that high, they might get one or two shots, but as the Mexicans advance, eventually what's gonna happen? Yeah, there'll be a blind spot. They can get up against the wall and it'll be really hard to shoot, to shoot at them. And the Mexicans charged. They did take some casualties, but they put them uh, 
Ladders up, climbed over the wall, and just overwhelmed the defenders, and it was over really fast. Really fast. Once they breached the wall here, it was done. The captains climbed over, overwhelmed the, uh, the I'm sorry, the Mexicans climbed over, overwhelmed the Texan defenders, and oh. Now, there's a mythology in, tap, in the history of this, and I, this is what I thought, that the Texans fought to the death. And that's why I was told partially because of one man's story. Davy Crockett. Davy Crockett was relatively well known at the time. He was a failed politician from Tennessee. We'll come back to him. He went there to get his, his, um, to kind of get a fresh start, and he got caught up in the Alamo. And the story was he fought to the last stand, uh, last man. In fact, this is a very famous painting, Davy Crockett's Last Stand. And here he is beating off Mexicans with his uh, rifle pump. And this is from a uh, cartoon or a comic book, Davy Crockett. And the reason why this was such a big deal, why I and so many people uh, who grew up in the in the 20th century believe that they fought to the death, partially because it's Texan mythology. But also because the most popular television show of the first age of television was The Adventures of Davy Crockett. And it was so popular, it's hard to even wrap your mind around it. It was so popular that the theme song became a number one song in America. Some of you have heard of it, and I think we should listen to it. Let me make sure the speakers are on. Do you want to hear the song? Yes. Are you excited? Yeah, okay, moving on. Well, it, um, this song was so popular. The funny thing was, um, Disney made a big gamble on something called Disney World, or Disneyland, I'm sorry, in the 50s. And they were desperate to try to make money, so they started producing these television shows, and they got this network called ABC to, to show it. ABC was brand new. And it was a big gamble for both of them, because Disney was broke. And now they've become a big hit. Disney now is going to become a company that owns, I think, pretty much all media, including ABC. So they would turn around and they would own the network that saved them. I always find that kind of fascinating. Economies of scale and monopoly. But what happened to them, really? Almost all of them were captured. <laughs> and all the survivors were lined up and shot. Almost all, including almost certainly Davy Crockett. The Mexicans fought under a black flag. No prisoners. Murder and fall. This was terror. They wanted the Texans to run away. South of San Antonio, a couple weeks later, 500 soldiers, um, militia, foolishly got themselves surrounded and surrendered at a place called Goliath. And they, this is a painting of it, were lined up and all executed too. More at Goli out there too, but Alamo is going to be glorified more because, you know, they, they fought even though they were overwhelmed very quickly. Goli out, they bumbled into a surrender. Now, the only reason I put this up here is this was a flag that one of the militia units had at Goli out. And that is, it's one of the coolest flags. You got to admit. The arm with the sword, and it's red. Because it also implies that he just cut his arm off. But that's happening. So the battle cry became, remember the Alamo, remember Goliath. And for the Texans, a lot might run away. But if you fight, you better fight to the death. And therefore, this would actually encourage the Texans to fight hard. Here's the Alamo by the 1890s. All the rest of the uh, mission was gone except for the church 
And it was about ready to be torn down. In fact, it's being used as a, as a restaurant since cafeteria. Yeah. This is 1890s. It was fortunately saved, and that's the Alamo today. I have no idea who that guy is. But it's pretty small. It's actually really small. And it's right in the middle of San Antonio, which is this massive town. The funny thing is, John Wayne, there's John Wayne playing Davy Crockett with the coonskin hat. He would make a movie in 1960 called The Alamo. Big budget movie. Eh, pretty cheesy because it's a John Wayne movie, but it's also kind of entertaining where they fight to the death. But they built kind of a model city in the Alamo outside of San Antonio. There's been a couple other movies filmed here. In fact, I think Mr. Larson's room is actually right at this moment um, watching the 1990s version of the Alamo film right here, which is kind of funny. But more people go to the movie set than the actual Alamo to this day, which I find really funny. Of course, then again, you're not in the middle of a little city. Well, this is going to be called, after this, Runaway Scrape. All the Texans start to run away. I mean, it looked like it was over. Sam and Houston is retreating eastward. It looks like it's done. But Santa Ana, gets, Santa Ana gets overconfident. He divides his forces up, thinking he could scoop up, just kind of surround and scoop them up like they're in a net. And that was a foolish move. By dividing them up, that gave Houston a, a chance. Houston's out in numbers. But his smaller force might be able to catch one of Santa Ana's smaller forces. So Houston kept retreating and retreating and retreating and retreating. And right here on San Jacinto Creek, Santa Ana's army, now incredibly overconfident, stopped to camp at a place called San Jacinto Creek, or San Jacinto River. There's a river and a couple of low hills, and he um, had his men not only really camp, they bought the afternoon day, you know, take a nap, take a siesta. You know, they took their saddles off their horses, you, but the cavalry used those as pillows. They didn't put many pickets or guards out because they thought, we're done. It's over. They got really overconfident. And the Mexicans were exhausted. Don't forget, they marched all the way from Mexico City. And they picked this place also because it's a flat clearing. And this is the painting that's actually at the battlefield at the um, National Park. It's surrounded by these low trees here. They're mesquite trees, which are like a really big bush. Has anyone ever been around mesquite trees? Did you? you do you remember anything about them? <clears throat> they want to have really long needles. They have long needles that stick out. So they're like a wall. You just rip yourself apart. And they thought, well, no one's going to jump us. No one will attack us. First line. Houston waited until the army was out there. Just, it kind of lucked out. They were totally unprepared, and he surprised them. He surprised them there and totally took them by surprise. Houston's men charged in and overwhelmed the Mexicans before they could organize any kind of defense. You don't need to know the numbers. Just look of the thousand Mexicans. Just look at the numbers. You don't need to know this. I just want to give you an idea how decisive this was. Of the 650 Mexican dead, most of them died after the battle was over. And the Texans, almost just in a fury of revenge, cut them down, murdered them, cold blood in response for Goliath and the Alamo. And look how few Texans died. This is an overwhelming victory. And now we have our local experts to talk about the Battle of San Juan You don't want to talk about the Battle of San Juan All right, good. Okay, all right. An overwhelming victory. Now, Santa Ana was able to flee to a, a, a low hill right here and watch the battle. And the thing is, he's not defeated. He's got over 2,000 men left. If he could unify them, Santa Ana can still win. It was a horrible setback, but the battle's not over. He's fine. He's watching this in furious. You're looking for somebody to blame. You know, that kind of thing. So imagine him on this hill. Let me draw you a picture. Let me take you to, Mac to Texas. If you haven't been to Texas, now you have been. And this is one of my better works of art. So imagine a low hill. Feel like you're there? You feel like it? It's very Texan. Now, Santa Ana's on top of this hill. So here's Santa Ana and his staff. How do you know which one's Santa Ana? 
He's the guy with the big hat. He's a general. Okay, so they're watching this. Now, the Texans had a couple of six-pound cannon, meaning they fired a six-pound cannonball. And they hadn't had, had a chance to fire them all day. They barely got them unlimbered. It was like the more battle's over. They look up, oh, we can fire at them. So they see those guys in the half, and they got the cannon. So just imagine we got the cannon here, and here's a, the Texans and the crew. We're good on that? How do we know the Texans? They have really big halves. Okay. So they're firing at the men up the hill. Cannibal. Well, they can't elevate the cannon enough. So it's hitting below them and bouncing up. So Santa Anna's watch, you're watching this, planning his escape, mad, not really pay attention, all of a sudden, bang, cannibal bounces by. Bang, cannibal bounces by. Bang, cannibal bounces right in front of him, starts bouncing out of him. What should he have done? What did he do? He put his leg out to stop it. <laughs> And the leg just ripped off. I mean, just hanging there by a couple of tendons. I mean, just an awful rip apart. Eventually, he would lose his leg. I mean, just awful. And let's put it this way. That hurts. And so they're rigging up a stretcher. Santa Ana's in agony. So someone comes up with a bright idea. Opium. So they give him some a pipe, and he starts smoking opium. And they're carrying him in this little makeshift stretcher down the hill and trying to hide in the mesquite because they're going to keep fighting. Well, the Mexicans that are surrendered and the ones that weren't murdered after the war, but they're or after the battle, they're surrendered and they're like, it's over, we're done. And all of a sudden, one of them sees Santa Ana being carried away and they're like, oh, Santa Ana, he's alive! And the Texans are like, oh, there he is. And they capture him. <laughs> so, Santa Ana on opium. Horribly wounded, signs away Texan independence. They're declared independent. They, they declared independence alone, but they want it here. And the Mexicans, of course, are going to say, they're not garbage. The treaty's not legit, but they're kind of stuck. So they're going to become the Lone Star Republic. That first flag of independence, I kind of like that one, it's kind of cool. But that was the first flag, but eventually copying the flag of the United States, right here, with the red, white, and blue, and the single star, and that's the flag of Texas today, or almost exactly, with that one single star for the one re for the Republic of Texas. So that's why the stars, like on everything, are a lot of things from Texas. And the other thing is this, they just assumed we're not going to be an independent country for long. Who is going to absorb us very quickly? They assume annexation. But the problem is, Texas came in with slave codes. So they have slavery. They said no international slave trade, but they have slave codes, which of course makes perfect sense. But now the issue of slavery in the territory comes up. Because if you want to annex this, this area north of the Rio Grande, all of this is what the Republic of Texas claimed. This is actually chaos, but they claim all of this. How many states could that be? Think about the size of eastern states. Couldn't that be seven or eight states? Would they have slavery or not? So annexation immediately became a big political fight. And what was the issue? Slavery. Almost immediately. Jackson wanted to do this, but he knew it might hurt the election of 1836. And so they sat on it. And year after year, Texas was in limbo. With the threat of Mexico all the time and the United States won't annex it because that could be 14 senators from slave states. The fear of slave power. And so we have Texas in limbo. And this is all anybody would talk about then for the next decade. Texas, Texas, Texas. And so this leads to a problem that could only be personified by this motion picture. Okay. 
I bet you weren't ready for this. One more time. Ready? Why are you going to ask? Because he could. Now, we've already talked about the election of 1836. I put this slide here just to remind you. So we've already, you already have this in your notes. Van Buren is going to win. The Whigs are going to divide up into three to try to split the electoral college. The problem is this. What's their view on Texas? If anybody makes a decision on Texas for or against annexation, we'll divide the party, both the Democrats and the Whigs. So what were their views on Texas? What's Texas? Never heard of it. And that is going to be the norm. Texas? Uh, don't know. Don't know. I should add, William Henry Harrison, old Tippy Canoe, did the best of the three. And that's why we're coming to, I'm going to skip ahead to the election of 1840. With the panic of 1837 going on, the Democrats are totally tied to this. But Van Buren's the president. So he's going to be renominated re in their second presidential cam um, campaign. But Texas, Van Buren tried to straddle the fence, basically saying, yes, we should probably annex Texas, but we should talk to other countries. And he basically made, made no sound decision, angering both the North and the South. And this gave a great opening to the Whigs. As we can see by our expert on Whig politics right here. Can you talk about the Whigs? Okay, okay. <laughs> so Whigs, they're kind of stupid. Wow. <laughs> no personal judgment there. I don't know what a wig is. I'm going to give you a wig. <laughs> Can't wait to read your test then. <laughs> I talked about him in this world. <laughs> okay. All right, so here we get to the Whigs. The Whigs would nominate William Henry Harrison. Harrison, old Tippy Canoe, he was already pretty old. And here's a big strategy. All right, we can't beat the democracy. It's here to stay. But what if we get our own task? What if we get our own? And what's Harrison? He's a Westerner. He's a war hero. And you know what's up with this. <coughs> it's got a few minutes. Oh, no. I, I did not tell what you were saying. I'm sorry, with the mask on, I was trying to be quiet. So, they thought they could pull Democratic voters. If we just pick somebody who's like Jackson, who's like him, we can convince him, okay, we like the image of Jackson. We like that culture of the Westerner. You like to feel like that way, even though most people aren't like that. And then avoid all major issues. Just avoid them. We're not going to talk about the major issues and push. Here's William Henry Harrison, the frontiersman, defeated Tecumseh at not just Tippecanoe, but the Battle of the Thames. But behind the scenes, Harrison supports the American system, which might have helped workers, but it was seen as anti common man. That's complex. But Here's the thing then. They're going to take these kind of elite policies, but act like a common man. And so this cartoon shows William Henry Harrison like a puppet being controlled by Clay and Daniel Webster, two prominent Whigs who want, who are pushing this um, programs to help capitalism. We're Democrats, many of them feared capitalism, but Her Harrison's campaign will avoid that issue and just say he's one of you. And this is a really important element. Because, why isn't this popping in? Oh, I hate when it does this. Why does it do this? So, they're going to try to do these cultural issues over economic issues. Try to push this idea of this Western culture and not the economic issues like the money supply or the Bank of the United States or even nullification, any of these issues. They're going to push these, hey, look at him. He's 
He's like Andrew Jackson. Old Tippy Canoe, isn't that like old Hickory? He's just like you. He doesn't care about such, such issues. He wants to go hunting for bar. Speaking of hunting for bar, that's what Davy Crockett was. Davy Crockett was that first to catch that image of this certain culture of the Westerner, which, by the way, is an incredibly effective political issue used. Um, it's still used as anything. Yeah, I'm checking my watch. To this very second, by cultural issues to try to give people to vote for them. Hey, they're more like me. And was the elements, remember Bacon's Rebellion? There's an element of that there. The indentured servants are more like the plantation owners. And so, there's a picture of Davy Crockett. He was this Westerner, he was rough hewn, he went to Congress. He's just like Davy, or he's just like Andrew Jackson. And that was the Whig's first real attempt to try to do this. It failed miserably, miserably because he was adult. He was so out of his, uh, um, out of his element and left in disgrace, left Congress in disgrace. He was the first Whig attempt to do this. That's why people knew about him at the Alamo. That's why eventually there'll be comic books, Lego figures, or atomic bombs. Fired from recoilless rifles named after Davy Crockett. This is the most insane weapon ever built. And that's saying a lot, because there's been a lot of insane weapons. Now, that's not the real one, that's the Lego version of it. I'm not making that up. But the Army wanted their own nuclear weapon they could fire. And they wanted it to be able to be, be um, packed in the back of the Jeep. So this was a 10 kiloton nuclear weapon. 10,000 pounds. Now, the atomic bomb drop in Hiroshima was 15 kilotons. And... And it was a really dirty bomb, a lot of radiation. So the crew would die of radiation sickness within about a day after they fired it. A death that would be hell beyond your comprehension. But they would make over a thousand of these and put them in West Germany during the Cold War, up until the late 1970s. And I want to go on record to say, and I'll say this again, we are so lucky with them. Because these guys are crazy. Thank you, Davy Crockett. Here's the song game if you want to hear it, but before we go, so we have the greatest and first ever campaign slogan, Tippy Canoe and Tyler Two. But here's the thing, they showed the divide in the Whig party. Harrison, old Tip, he hated the democracy. What do you want in pro-business policies? Tyler, was a southerner from Virginia. He didn't want those pro-business policies. He wanted ones that would favor the big slave labor camps, the plantations. They just hated democracy. They hated the fact that commoners have a voice over them. That's what Tyler hated. He actually was a Democrat until he realized that Jackson was um, not gonna support the interests of the big plantation owners. And so, they actually disagree on almost everything like the American system. But what does the vice president do? They only have two constitutional powers, bring ties to the Senate and become the angel of death. Yes, that's what presidents would call them. On your way out, do you want to hear it? Do you want to hear the song? Yeah.
Okay. Why wouldn't I? You're going to throw it. Thinking about it. I feel like you should. Like, I'm like, a lot of high school just like a student. Just a random student? Yeah, anybody. And so, we'll have a drawing? Yeah. Or raffle. Or raffle. Or raffle. Or raffle. <laughs> one person will win a kick out, the other one has a desk for it. Guys, we got to test the fence, though. Uh, suspense. somebody forgot to record, so give me a second to finish recording. I need uh, somebody to, to hand something out. Thank you. Also, everybody grab one of those packets there. It's not all for this unit. Most of what we do on Monday, it's not till then. Okay. Lindsay. Yeah. Thanks for putting your break. Oh, okay. Is that exciting? You know how many girls have that exact same It's freaking cool, though. <laughs> Dude, I honestly want to see another one. And they have it in gray, though. Born in a mousetrap. Yeah, let's see. And of course, you really want to get it. I would laugh. You're like, yeah, I'm going. 